So, uh, everybody, thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Jeff Delisi. I am a uh, member of the Board of Directors of the City of Chamber of Commerce, which is hosting this event tonight. Um, we're happy to have a nice turnout and have all our candidates here with us. Uh, I've been asked to go through a few ground rules, kind of explain the format, how we're going to do it. Um, so before I do the, before I forget this, I think Bob, Jesse, where are you, Bob? I'm up here. Oh. <laughs> Bob, I'm supposed to point out where the exits are in the bathrooms. I think the bathrooms are back here behind me. Bathrooms are the exit, both sides and here. Okay. Do this. Okay, great. Um, Don't come up here. <laughs> so I guess the format for tonight, uh, I've been provided questions. Uh, I also have had a few questions myself, which I submitted to myself. Uh, but essentially, uh, each candidate here tonight is going to give an opening remark for three minutes. They'll have a maximum of three minutes for the remark. They don't need to take it off. Uh, and then we're going to kind of, uh, uh, after that, I think it's going to launch into questions from me, which are questions that were given to me uh, by the chamber, and then I will ask the questions. What I'm told is that we're going to do it in groups of, uh, first it's going to be the selectmen, then it's going to be uh, planning board, then it's going to be uh, the moderator, after that library, and, and at the end, which I know are the only contested races, uh, the format is not chosen by me, uh, it, will be the, it will be the school committee. So um, uh, each, each candidate will have two minutes to respond to the question. Uh, the uh, folks in the back uh, are holding up signs. Can uh, everybody see it? Yes. yes. Which are just signs notifying we don't have a digital clock. Uh, when, when 30 minutes are left. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. <laughs> 30 seconds. <laughs> Uh, and then basically uh, at the end we're going to wrap it up with two minutes each for closing statements. Uh, just a statement on decorum. Uh, I don't have to tell folks here in this beautiful community uh, any no lecture from me about decorum. Uh, the concept here though is that this is going to be not a Q&A session with audience to, uh, to candidates. Any issues or things that might arise need to be addressed through me and it would be my discretion on how to handle it. Um, but no booing, no hissing, and things of that nature, which I know no one's going to do anyway. Yeah, so, uh, have I missed anything, Jean or Susan? No, I think you're good. Okay, so uh, why don't we start with, uh, with the Board of Selectmen and, uh, what, actually, why don't we just have a brief introduction right across the table. And then, and then we'll start with uh, Karen Conley, um, excuse me, Karen Canfield, and then we'll move on from there. So, no, you yeah, got it. <laughs> start to say who you are and what, what you're running for. Absolutely, great. So, thank you so much for coming tonight, everybody. Thank you to no, Jeff. Hold on, hold on. Just, just your name. Just, I just want. Oh. I, you know what? Actually, everybody is placards. I didn't even see that. So, why don't we just move right in okay. uh, to Karen? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, I was told after you and I spoke that you're going to do it sitting down. <laughs> so it doesn't make that much of a difference with me. <laughs> I think you're comfortable, right? I don't know. I'm good. It's, it's good to see everybody. Thank you so much. I didn't know I was going to be first, but I'm happy to be here. Um, my name is Karen Canfield. I've been serving on the select board um, since uh, 2017. I have been a resident of the Situ for almost 30 years, uh, which is remarkable to me because I feel like I just started here, but I've been working with um, various community groups since 1994, um, and which doesn't hold a candle to this gentleman you'll meet shortly, who I met and, as a library trustee, and he's on his 27th year serving the town. 22. So, 22. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to just take a quick moment before I just give you a little overview on, on the select board, and I know my, my colleague and fellow Karen C. will elaborate as well, um, is 
having served on so many committees and having been in this role for a while, um, I think everyone in this room knows that you know we're all volunteers. Uh, this is and, and we're asked to take on responsibility on behalf of the residents of this town. So I commend everybody for for sitting up here and committing the time and energy uh, it, it has it requires to do this job well. And and I have to say that it has been my honor to work with literally a, at least I don't know Peter and I counted at one time like 110 people serve on volunteer boards and committees in this community. So if you're so inclined, we will take your name and number. Um, <laughs> briefly, uh, the last two years, obviously, I'm delighted that we're here in person and not in little boxes anymore. Um, and I'm very proud of our town. All of the boards, committees that I just mentioned, our public health, our public safety, our school committees, have, did above and beyond to make sure that our community was safe, that our kids could keep learning, that we could respond to you know, things we had no idea we were gonna be tasked with responding. And on top of that, just keep stuff going that we normally wanna keep going. So it was, it was quite a challenging year, and, um, or two years and two months, uh, and I'm very proud of the work that was done. A um, Couple of things that we did accomplish, we accelerated investments in our school buildings to make sure when the kids came back, and I'm sure these guys will talk about that, uh, were um, healthy environments for our kids to come back. We, with some of the, in the room, we created the Situate Loves Local. I got 30 seconds, all right, um, to, uh, to really help support our small businesses. Uh, I just want to quickly touch on the next three years are going to be very exciting years. We have a water treatment plant to build. We are hoping to get sewer for North Situate so we can do the good work there that we want to do. We're updating our town charter. We're going to do something with Pier 44, um, and we're going to be launching a whole bunch of economic development projects. I mention all of these because all of them require hands and hearts to get things done, because as I started my remarks, it's volunteers that do it, and the music is planned. So thank you. I hope that you'll come vote when, uh, on election day. So, I'm Karen Connolly, which means I'm Karen Con, <laughs> and Karen Canfield is Karen Can. <laughs> I didn't like that, so we went to a K1, K2 uh, way of referring to ourselves, but um, it's been a pleasure to serve on the board. Not every day is a great day, but most days are very good days, and if I can help someone get something done, it makes my day. Um, I am not a Facebook person. I don't go on Situate Monthly. I read it, but I don't respond. But if you want to talk to me, you can call me. I'm happy to talk to anyone. I like to meet people for coffee. I like to talk to people on the phone. I prefer not to get into email wars with people. I think things get misinterpreted. Um, so I've been uh, a resident of Situate uh, off and on since 1965. My parents moved here into a summer cottage that my father then decided to winterize. I don't advise it. Um, <laughs> he then let us move into a real house, and we lived in back of the tennis courts in North Situate, which is now the playground. Um, I've certainly seen a lot of change in town, and I know that people aren't necessarily happy sometimes when things change, um, but nothing ever stays the same. And we've got this, a similar situation coming up with the water treatment plant. Uh, one of the challenges we have as a town is the fact that we do not have a lot of land. And it's very hard to find pieces of property for municipal purposes. And we purposely bought the land on 3A as a municipal piece of property so that we would have the potential to put the water treatment plant there. Um, I know people are probably going to ask questions of us about that, but I will say I would prefer to have it go in a place where it is as unobtrusive as possible. And one of the problems we've got with the, uh, the location down at Greenbush is, is that you may not be aware, but the reason the ball field is there is because uh, I believe it was the Clapp family left that land to the town, deeded it, uh, and wanted it for recreation purposes. I personally don't want to see us get into a mess where the wishes of the people who donated or deeded the land to us aren't uh, listened to, aren't re uh, respected. So um, I have also served on a number of boards in town. 
but I will say, uh, serving on the select board, I can only call it the SS situate. <laughs> you have no idea what goes on and how much goes on, and I see my 30 second uh, is up. So it's, it's a great pleasure to, um, to be here tonight, and I ask for your vote uh, on May 21st, 19th. The last election was May 19th, so that's burned into my brain. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next we'll go to uh, Jim Toomey, who's our town moderator, and he's running for his position. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, my name is Jim Toomey. I'm running for my fourth term as moderator. A little background. Uh, I've lived in Situate as of next week. It'll be 26 years. Um, Again, time flies. Um, my background is that I was practicing the way I had a law practice in Quincy. A uh, major part of our practice was municipal law. I served as a town council in Hanover for 30 years, the town council in Hingham for a little over 25 years, and I was the town council here in Sitchwood for about uh, 10 years. So I've had a lot of experience with uh, municipal law. In addition, I represented school committees throughout the state, and I've attended a lot of town meetings. Uh, but I have to tell you, it's, it's always interesting and exciting to go to a town meeting because you never know what's going to happen. It's wonderful to see people turn out. I was out to dinner the other night and ran into a woman who happened to be a lawyer. We were chatting. She has, she's lived here all her life and she hasn't missed a town meeting since 1986, the young woman. And she had lots of stories about what she had seen at town meeting. It was, it was enjoyable to, to see that. Uh, people complain that, you know, it's tough to get out at night and go to the meetings. There is no alternative to that that is allowed in Massachusetts right now. And, uh, and frankly, it's one or three nights a year um, and, people, and people know it's coming. It's really great to see people participate. Uh, that's my philosophy running the meeting is one, to be fair to everybody, make sure everybody has a say. Two, to get the business done. We're, we are conducting business and we have to make sure we've got the I's and cross the T's in terms of the legal uh, requirements and we try to do that efficiently and the courtesy and the respect seems to bubble out of the ground. That has not been a problem since uh, I've been a select, uh, a moderator here. I don't want to be a select. <laughs> <laughs> I like to have four or five meetings a night, four or five night meetings a year. That, that works pretty well for me. So thank you all for our, your attention and um, hope we'll see you all at town meeting. We are going to have some openings on advisory. What, one of my jobs is to appoint members of the advisory and the capital planning committee. We're going to have some openings as people transition. So if anyone is interested or you know of anybody who would be good candidates, we're going to be doing that the next month or so. So I'd appreciate it if uh, people could come forward. Thank you. All right, excellent. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. Uh, next, we're going to go over to the planning board. I believe I see Ann Burbine here. Ann? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Ann Burbine, I have been on the planning board off and on for about almost 30 years. I've come and gone, and then here I am again. <laughs> um, I love the position. I absolutely do. I think it is one of the most, the planning board is one of the most important boards, if not the most, in the town. And to, to say what Karen Conley had said, no one likes change. No one does. It is very difficult. But it's the only constant that we have. So the planning board tries really hard to listen to everyone, public <coughs> hearings, uh, we will sit down on the side with people to try to help them figure out where they're going and how they're going to get there. We have a number of issues that will be facing us over the next several years, including the new housing initiative that has come down from the Commonwealth that has to do with housing around our transportation centers. Situate is supposed to come up with somehow, some way, 1,200 more units. Doesn't mean they necessarily have to be built, but it's on, going on the books. We have water issues. We have to deal with that, water treatment plant, and so on. Our master plan has finally been 
enacted. We have an implementation committee put together that is in the process of delegating and how we will implement that master plan. Um, there are some projections about population that will need to be dealt with. The other thing that was mentioned that hopefully someday the train will come to North Situate. We have worked very hard on planning to ensure that we have put zoning in place that will benefit the town. And we have pretty much put it in place in North Situate so when sewer comes it won't be the Wild West. That there will be parameters that people have to follow in order to build the mixed use apartments, etc. If and when sewer comes. I may never live to see it, but you <laughs> never know. So, but thank you all uh, for being here. I've been in this town now for just about 50 years, I've seen a lot of change, and a lot of it has stayed the same. It's still a wonderful, caring community. And I, my children have gone through school here, my grandchildren through school. And I'm not going anywhere. So <laughs> thank you all. Hopefully we'll see. And what I really want more than anything is to get more young people involved. We need you. We need you desperately. Because some of us are getting a little long in the tooth. <laughs>
uh, to uphold what we have the library for in the first place. So I haven't seen a 30 second sign up so I can sing and dance for a bit, but you, <laughs> you wouldn't enjoy that, so I will now turn it back to the moderator. My name is Tara Bukowski and I am running for school committee. I have to say it's a real pleasure to hear from my colleagues and I think a real testament to our community that so many people are willing to contribute and volunteer and remain in our town for so long. So I just, it heartens me as a newer member of the, the town to hear all these great stories. Um, to give you a little bit of background, I am a wife, I am a mom of three kids. We have twin first graders and a fourth grader in Hatherley. Um, and I'm also an educator. I have spent, I was counting the years, I won't tell you how many years, but I have, been, I have spent all but one year of my professional career as a professor in higher education. I've been at community, I started my career at community colleges working in a business school. I moved into four-year institutions and I now teach graduate students and actually I feel very privileged because I actually work with uh, doctoral students in what's called a practice doctorate and it's in a school of education so every day I'm working with superintendents, teachers, uh, principals, and other leaders around challenges and opportunities that they have in their professional context. Um, I've been, I am the newest member of the school committee. I've, I've had the pleasure of serving since, I guess, September. Um, and it's been a real pleasure to learn and listen to my colleagues. Um, I would say that, um, I, as I said, I'm a newer member of, of Situate. We've been in town for about six years. It'll be six years in, in June, actually. And we arrived in town with a kindergartner. So we were first time parents of a kindergartner. So we had a new community, a new town, a new school, and new experiences. And what I know to do as a learner is to get involved to get my questions answered, to connect with the community, to really understand what my kids were going to be learning, I had to get involved. So after meeting with uh, Principal Fitzmaurice, who was previously the wonderful principal at Hatterley, I showed up for the PTO meeting in September. And before I realized it, in 15 minutes, I had volunteered to be on the school council, which is the advisory committee for the principal. Um, and, and it just so happened that somebody else was interested, so we actually had an official election of two people. So, so from there, I really just got more involved. I was involved in Halloween parties, something called a cannon bottle drive, which I had never known about being from Maryland. Um, and I'll give you a little tip. If you ever really want to get to know the schools, the best way to get to know the schools is to be a part of school store. I'm telling you, it's one Friday a month, and you go in there, and you get to hear the hustle and bustle of the teachers, the students. They wheel and deal with you, and I will tell you a story which is hilarious. I was working school store one day, um, and I was moving around, running around with another parent, and this little second grader looked at me, and I took, took his money, and I said, here's your chain, and he said, you know what? You keep that chain because you're working really hard. <laughs> so I'm telling you, sorry. So thank you, uh, thank you so much for having me tonight. <laughs> four children at Situate Public Schools, and um, they are in kindergarten, first grade, fifth grade, and seventh grade. I have, with those children, a combined 17 years worth of experience and involvement in our schools to date. Uh, I'm also an educator and a mental health professional. I've been working in the field for over 15 years. I've worked in both private and public school systems from Boston to suburban districts, as well as at the, at the college level. Uh, I have a thorough experience and knowledge of Situate Public Schools, the functions of a school system, policies, procedures, curriculum development, and more. 
Uh, I also served seven years as vice president of the Cushing PTO, plus five years on Cushing School Council. So I bring with me that experience, which really gives you sort of an, an in-depth, very kind of micro level of what goes on inside of a building in terms of budgeting, PTO-wise. Uh, I also had the privilege of serving on the elementary school configuration subcommittee uh, prior to serving on school committee. And so I've also coached in town youth sports. I'm a Girl Scout troop leader. I teach religious education. Uh, in my role on school committee, I serve on several subcommittees. I've got capital planning experience, the town, town charter review, recreation liaison, school council, DEI, negotiations, district policy, and bargaining subcommittees. Um, so as you can see, I'm a doer, um, and I'm extremely proud of all the accomplishments that have happened during my tenure, some of which are still in the beginning and middle stages, including new school buildings, we're working on websites, curriculum review, lots of advocating for art and music, mental health, um, some of the other things that I'm really proud of in terms of my record of the past three years are our fourfold investment in SPS curriculum, professional development for educators, community partnerships and opportunities for students. We've done all these things very, very sustainably to ensure that the tax dollars of situate residents are being spent wisely and appropriately on academics, technology, enrichment, unique collaboration opportunities, and more. During my tenure, we've been able to eliminate full day kindergarten fees, which is a savings of up to $4,000 per child for families. That's huge, especially during the pandemic. We've also eliminated athletic fees, again, a savings of up to $900 for families. We've increased our pay scale for substitute teachers. We've had lots of new hires. I've hired, I've been a part of teams that have hired a superintendent, an assistant superintendent, director of special education, director of business and finance, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm not going to have enough time to fit all my accomplishments over the past three years into three minutes. Uh, but as you can see, I'm somebody who you can count on to get the job done. If you have a question, I'm going to find you that answer. So, thank you. Okay, and I believe Richard Taft is here this evening. Richard? Thank you. Uh, my name is Richard Taft. I'm running for the school committee. I'll be running against Nicole Brandon Lee. Um, someone said to me, it's a contentious election. I would prefer to think it's a contested election. There's nothing contentious about trying to serve our community. Uh, we're both volunteers. We want to do what's best. Uh, even though we disagree, I'm sure, on some things, I suspect that 90% of the things that we want to accomplish in our school, we agree on. Um, I don't, uh, I'm not Italian, didn't come from Situate. I grew, moved here about eight years ago. Uh, I've lived, uh, grew up in uh, Rhode Island. I lived in Atlanta for 15 years. Uh, I had jobs. I had a, a couple of jobs while I lived in Atlanta that sent me all over the world. I got to do a lot of work with a lot of businesses. Got to meet a lot of different people and understand that um, you know most people in the world, in fact, pretty much everybody I've met wants pretty much the same thing. We want our kids to have a better life than we did. Right? And we all know that education is the reason and the key to that. And uh, so, you know, I lived in Canada for four or five years before moving to Situate in uh, 2014. Um, the reason I'm running is uh, over the last few years, I've got introduced uh, to some, some really the social issues of the day. So the things that we read about and see every day on television. And frankly, I did want to be involved in that, right? I, I wanted to send my, my child just like everyone else and uh, have her go to school, get a great education. And what I discovered, though, is that there's, a, there's this very particular way in which we look at things <clears throat> that has taken over the social um, construct. And as much as I didn't want to believe it, it happened. It happened in our school committee. And the, the best example and the biggest example, and if you go to my website, you'll see it, is our school committee drafted an anti-racist statement. And anti-racism, as I got to know it, um, is a concept developed by critical race theory. It basically believes that either you are a racist or you are not. Uh, you're either a racist or an anti-racist. There's no in-between. There's no colorblind society. So, you know, and it's not, and I, and I raise these things along the way as we're trying to draft this statement. And every point along the way, this point of view, my point of view, people that think like me, that believe in a colorblind society, really wasn't accepted. And so the school committee went on to adopt a statement. <clears throat> the first part of it says, we want an open, we want an accepting 
um, part of our school that doesn't discriminate, doesn't bully, creates a, uh, an open and fair environment for everybody. And that's what I want. But what they went on to say is that, no, our school system is currently systemically racist. And they gave us no information. They gave us nothing to substantiate that. And that's what's led me down this path to run the school committee. I don't believe that. And it's not true. Thank you. Um, I will just tweak the answer a little bit. I know we have two minutes and Jane will keep me honest. Um, as my colleague pointed out, the, the land was purchased on 3A as a possible site. Um, and it is being recommended at this point as the site. And the reason we need a water treatment plant is the plant that we have right now, I believe was built in 1960-something. Uh, it is outdated. It is, it has, it, there's a, not to get too geeky, but there's no redundancy. So if something goes wrong, we can't use it, period, and that's just not good practice and it's not recommended in the design of a, of a proper water treatment plant. Uh, one of the big, it is a big piece of the whole puzzle of addressing brown water and also addressing our supply, uh, making sure we have enough water as well as good water. With a new treatment plant, we will be able to have redundant services so that we can actually not have the worry of, you know, something going wrong from a, a, seven, a 60 year old facility um, and we can also design a system that will remove all of the mag, uh, manganese. manganese, thank you, I always get the G wrong, manganese which is the source of our brown water. Um, the other huge benefit of a newly and modern facility is right now when you clean water you get stuff that you're not going to send into the water system, you have to treat it, and the way it is treated now is it's sent to our sewer plant. If we build a state-of-the-art facility, that's, I believe it was 30,000 gallons a day, will, be, will no longer be sent to our sewer, so it solves another problem as well. So the short answer, because I only had a short uh, uh, moment, is it will improve our quality of our water and it will also um, improve the uh, quantity because of its efficiency as a new plant. Okay, great. Um, I'd like to give uh, uh, Karen Conley an opportunity to weigh in on that. I know you addressed it in your initial statements and you probably share the same, same uh, uh, comment uh, of uh, select person Canfield. Uh, if you have anything to add, feel free. I don't. She summed it up perfectly. <laughs> I mean, we sit in the same meetings, we read the same reports. Um, the, the work that's gone into uh, this particular issue, it's not just about the water treatment plant, it's about the delivery of water, it's about more sources of water, it's about um, if you can't, if you don't have good, clean, dependable water, you might as well just pack it up and go home. <laughs> So um, I feel as though this is the most, most urgent thing that we have on our plate. It has been underway for many years in terms of uh, staging, the, uh, the, the replacing the water mains, replacing uh, uh, services to houses, um, and it's just, it has to be done. And if, if I'm reelected, if no one runs a sticker campaign against me, <laughs> it's number one on my list. And, uh, she gave a very good summary of why. Thank where, you. Uh, where are we at right now with the, uh, in the process of replacing or repairing water mains? How, how far along are we in that process? Yeah, sure. It's like $19 million we spent so far. Uh, just it's, actually, we're up to 25 because. So it's, it's um, I, I, and I will say that this predated our, our um, welcoming Ms. Conley to the board. So this project about, 
seven years ago master plan to address the groundwater um, problems was um, implemented in addition to just sort of the regular servicing. And um, what has occurred is every year, it started with two miles a day, uh, two miles a year of uh, the most awful, <laughs> there's no other word, the two inch galvanized steel pipes or uh, cast iron pipes um, and worked our way. Two miles a year was it, and we upped it to three miles because it just wasn't going fast enough. Once those pipes were fixed, the really, really old ones, you could then flush. I know, you, I think you probably all see that great video where they put the slush through and get all the mud out. Um, you couldn't do that when the pipes were fragile because you did that, they would explode and then you got broken water mains. So it's been a very conscious plan to uh, move forward and uh, we are up, I think it's up to 25 million now and uh, it continues every year and thank you for supporting that capital investment every year because it's the only way we're gonna fix it. Uh, so, like Kirsten Conley, uh, the, the question concerns who are situated in the sewer. Um, so, the, uh, there are some great businesses in North Situate, but the village needs more support. What is the status of the sewer hookups, both using the existing or future Situate wastewater treatment facility and or the town hall's plan by Cohasset in order to support existing and encouraging businesses? What's the last part of that? Uh, supporting think, businesses? Yes. Yeah, okay. I, I get the general gist of yeah. the question. Yeah. Um, well, I, we all know that North Situate needs sewer. Uh, the question is how. Uh, we have been trying very hard. I was looking at uh, the advisory committee report today. I was looking for something else, and I came across the fact that town meetings supported uh, situate joining with Hull and Cohasset to do a regional solution. That was a couple of years ago. Uh, much to our frustration, uh, Cohasset has proven to be very difficult to deal with. Um, and I'm being frank about it. They, we think we get to a point where they're, they're on board and then they go back and they're, uh, they're not really on board. And one of the reasons why is they have a select board and they have a separate elected sewer commission. There are three sewer commissioners. There are five select people, and with elections and everything, the boards change, and they, we just can't get them to agree. Um, the sewer commissioners have been the real sticking point. Uh, the last thing I heard was that they've agreed to do it. I'm not sure. I believe it until it's, they've signed on the dotted line. I was at a meeting recently, maybe about three months ago, where we thought we had an agreement with the sewer commissioner, the, the head of the sewer commission, and a couple of the select board people, and only to find out they came back and said, well, we're still not sure. To summarize, it would be the preferred alternative because we, the state is encouraging uh, regional solutions to problems, and um, I think that's a good thing to do regional solution. But if we can't, we're just going to have to keep going down the path of trying to uh, make our uh, sewer pipes not leak as much. And that we did at Cedar Point, and that's been successful, but now we have to go and do more of that. So I wish I could tell you this problem would be solved tomorrow. It's not going to be solved tomorrow. But I assure you, it is after the water treatment plant, sewering North Situate is number two. And we're not going to give sewer to anyone else until we do that. <laughs> yeah, two very important issues, no doubt, in the town. Probably two of the most important. Uh, so, uh, Karen Canfield, uh, the question is, uh, we are already in a phase one water restriction, and the population will increase during the summer months. In order to help preserve our water availability, have the selectmen considered whether it is appropriate or feasible to put a moratorium on building permits? Well, there's a real possibility I'm going to get really geeky on this answer. <laughs> um, is there, would we put a moratorium? So the short answer on I'm that sure is. Legal, but, pardon me? I'm not legal. sure it's legal, but. Thank you, yeah. Counselor. That's yeah. exactly what I was going to say, is that. Um, the problem, I mean, there, there, there are ways in which we could do so, but the problem is the stuff you don't think about when you, when you go that route. If you put a building or a sewer or a water, I don't think you can do it with water, uh, a building moratorium, and would know better than that. 
But you could do a sewer moratorium, which would effectively be the same thing um, if you couldn't park is that it impacts everything. It impacts your property values, it into impacts economic development, and all those down, literally downstream things. So feasibility, no. Um, I will note that the mandatory May 1st uh, restrictions is a state-imposed um, requirement. If we do not demonstrate that we are good stewards of, stewards of our water supply, um, writ large for the Commonwealth, not just our community, then we will find that we will be facing positions of, that would further restrict our water. Yeah, you know, basically, you have to show that you're, you're doing everything you can to make sure that the water is available to, for people to drink and not to water your lawn. And that's how the Commonwealth looks at it. And that's why if you go to any community, and I think any community in the Commonwealth at this point, um, with a few exceptions out west, is that's what it's for, is for people to drink, not for, for water, water in your lawn. Does that answer the question? Sounds, sounds good to me. Uh, okay, so Karen uh, Conley. Uh, the next question is kind of a specific question, but uh, it, it, has to do, it has to do with uh, storm surges, mitigation, sea level rise. And so the questioner asks, uh, when uh, indicates that there have been studies in a master plan designed to mitigate the effects of uh, storm surges and sea level rise to the heart, and then it says, uh, when can we expect a proposal to the town? I'm not sure. I don't have any specific information on the premise of the question, whether it's accurate or not. But what's the situation with uh, storm level? How how we're tackling storm level rise? We're passing notes up here. <laughs> Master planning. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> um, well, we do have the harbor resiliency uh, plan that was done, and as part of the bigger picture, I'm not telling anyone anything you don't know. To do even what they suggested we do in the harbor would be beyond our capacity at this point to do. So I think what we're going to have to do is take small steps and try to figure out what is implementable. I mean, with the Harbor Resiliency uh, Plan, they were talking about raising Cole Parkway, having parking underneath, having revetments, <coughs> having, it's very elaborate. And it's, it would be great to do it. They also suggested that we should move all the businesses off of Front Street up the hill, which would mean we'd have to rezone all of those streets up the hill. I'm telling you something that is probably frightening to some people, but we at least have to consider some of these things. I mean, the fact is, is that there are a lot of people who think that we shouldn't let, if, if there's storm damage on, let's pick Peggy Beach, where there used to be house by house by house by house by house. Now you look at Peggy Beach and there are vast stretches of it between houses. That's because those people decided to take a buyout from the federal government after the blizzard of 78. Um, we don't have the money to do that. I'm not sure that the federal government even has the money to do it wherever it should be done because we're not just talking about coasts, we're talking about rivers, lakes, we're talking about the U.S. has a big problem in terms of water that is inundating us from everywhere. And I see 30 seconds. <laughs> Answer that in Thank two you. minutes. Thank you. That was excellent. Um, so there's, I have two more questions here. Uh, I know. We probably should move on from the select board, but just very briefly, the questions concern uh, parking in the harbor and, 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 and whether, uh, I guess there's a frustration expressed between uh, allowing parking for basically storage of trucks uh, uh, versus, uh, there's, there's a crowd, everybody trying to get parking at Cole Parkway in the summertime. Has, has have, have the select been discussed at all? How to, how to handle that situation in recent memory, Karen? Uh, I can't feel I'm sorry. It's <laughs> to you. K1 and K2? Yeah. That actually is a good question for yeah, me. Yeah, it's very specific. So. Um, it, well, it's, it's a pariah. You want to? Yeah, I, I'd like to uh, sure. ask everyone to remember when there was like nothing down there, right? <laughs> there were no signs, There was, and it was free for all. 
and we had all kinds of problems. So we put together, the select board did, I wasn't on at the time, so I can't take credit for it, but they put together this elaborate system of one way here, one way there, A, B, C, D, you have to read the sign to know where, that has made no one happy. <laughs> so all I can say is we do have a finite amount of land for people to park their cars. And the fact is, is that people should be parking their cars further down if they can and walking. Um, that's what you do when you're in Boston, don't you, in a city? You don't have a... Someone was complaining yesterday in the select board office about not being able to park in front of Starling's Bakery when she wants a scone. <laughs> Could you go across the street to Pole Parkway and walk over and get your scone and then you can walk it off? So... <laughs> I'm not trying to be fresh here, but I was like, what? Okay, well, but she doesn't get her scone if she can't get the parking space. So I was like, well, that's a good idea. Just ride by and not have your scone. So. So the answer is yes, we talk about it. We talk about it. And when we do something about it, people don't like it. Um, finally, last question, uh, Karen Canfield, I'll try and get you again. Uh, it really just about outdoor seating in restaurants along uh, uh, Front Street. Uh, the, the writer of the question is concerned or uh, frustrated about handicap, about the, the payoff between seating and, and using and not using, being able to use a sidewalk for handicap accessibility. And it's probably more common than a question. It's more, I think that this person probably is looking for uh, the selectmen, the select board to address that situation so that that person can use the sidewalk. Yeah, that, that is a really important and, and uh, critical decision in anything that, you know, when we basically do anything, one of the lenses we do is how are we impacting people with mobility issues, all of that. So the, um, the sidewalk seating was a, was a byproduct, I think a happy byproduct for the most part, of, of COVID. People needed to, you know, and they had reduced capacity in the restaurants, we let people go on the sidewalk. In, in, in principle, no one is, they're all approved so that there is handicap access around wherever that it is um, uh, a permitted. Um, if that is not in practice what somebody's finding, they should let us know right away because they are all approved with that very much in mind. So um, give us a call. Okay, excellent. Thank you, uh, select board candidates. Uh, thank you for spending time to answer those questions. Feel free to stick around. to show that you are vibrant, is to have all the parking spaces filled. <laughs> filled. And I had someone say to me that there's no parking in the harbor. Well, why? Well, I couldn't park in front of CVS, therefore there is no parking. <laughs> I was on the parking study back in the 90s, early 90s, 
after the um, feds redid Front Street. And there's a bone of contention about how many parking spaces were in fact lost. They're quite, they don't quite remember. But the reality is, and my philosophy has always been, because I have been a businesswoman in North Situate for over 30 years. I do not concern myself with parking. <laughs> if, if I have what people want, they show up. And this is true regardless of where you are. So we can make all kinds of rules and regulations. Part of it has to do with enforcement of a lack thereof. So I'm on traffic rules and regulations. We talk about this stuff all the time. You know, let's give a ticket or two occasionally, but we don't. So that old field of dreams thing, if you build it, they will come. Believe me, I have never been busier. <laughs> so, and we have a new group up in North Situate, Board 143, they have never been busier. If you want it, it's there. The biggest issue we have on Front Street are the condos that do not have any assigned parking. And somehow, we have to figure that one out. Not sure how to do it. But then again, if you buy something in that bay and there's no parking, what do you do? And people did buy these condos knowing that there was no parking. So, but we have to figure it out because it's really not fair. I'm all Thanks, Anne. That was spot on there. <coughs> so uh, I, I believe, uh, Robert, uh, Robert, uh, a question for you uh, is, is uh, concerns the North Situate uh, Business District. And the question is, on the heels of 2001 town meeting adopting the planning board's zoning proposal that established the North Situate Village Center in the neighborhood district, what suggestions do you have for next steps to make North Situate a more attractive business district? So really, you know, what this is about obviously is how can we attract businesses and how can we uh, improve the aesthetics of North Situate if you have any ideas on, on that? Well, so on the, <clears throat> excuse me, on the planning board in the last, uh, I'd say in the last year, uh, we had the, uh, the North Situate business group come in and um, they had a consultant uh, develop some plans and possibilities for uh, re not remaking but upgrading um, some of the infrastructure, not if the, some of the buildings in North Situate uh, and making a kind of a planned business district. And I think the planning board and I, I agree with our decision that we like that idea and we'd like to see that idea go forward. Um, may I? Sure. Okay. As a merchant, as a former member of um, a number of other committees, North Situate basically is owned by five landlords. That's it. Five. My entire block is owned by one. Another block, another one. They are all waiting for sewer and they have been waiting for a very long time. We actually are at capacity, there are no vacant spaces in North Situate. They're all, <coughs> all of them. But also too, North Situate is for sale. The Hingham Institute was sold, and it's a cooperative space. I think that they're waiting. If they have sewer, it'll be a great restaurant. Boundbrook Court sold, that's, waiting for God knows what. <laughs> then the big apartment, the brown apartment building at the end of Country Way before Cohasset, that sold. And they're in the process of coming before the planning board to talk about housing, apartments, etc. cetera. Where Taj is, you all know where that is across from what used to be Tedeschi's, it always be Tedeschi's, 7-Eleven, um, <laughs> whatever it is. Okay, that whole building sold. So things are in a state of flux. But the planning board has put zoning in place that will ensure that it will not be the Wild West. That there are certain things that have to be done, that will be done, special permits, matter of right, etc. We're on it, believe me, we are on this. Thanks, thanks both, both of you for answering that question. Uh, 
Uh, and next question to you uh, concerns the tension between permits and comprehensive permits, um, meaning, uh, uh, let's see here. Do you mean 40 d Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, what steps? <laughs> sorry. <I'm being laughs> that's just me. Uh, what steps can the planning board take? Uh, to encourage reasonable applications for subdivision or special permits so as to avoid the other consequence whereby a developer can construct a larger project that is not required to follow local situate regulations. Well, we have a project that may be coming forward in Greenbush that with our zoning as a matter of right, because he has one acre of property, he can build 16 apartments as a matter of right. So that is in place. And one of the big issues, as I stated earlier, we have this incentive, if you will, for lack of a better description, from the state to come up with all of this housing. The issue is, if you go to 40B, they're all one bedrooms for these affordable units, and it should not be that way. It should be two or three bedrooms. And that's what we need. We do need apartments and we need affordable apartments. The um, Drew Company is building 72 units, 17 of them will be affordable. So there are things that are coming down the pike. When somebody wants to come in with 40B, I think the head of the Zoning Board of Appeals is handling the one on Old Open Bucket beautifully from what I have heard and what I have been told. And he has even asked, that these have one, these have two and three bedroom units. And they will happen. This is going to happen. Somebody asked me, is this a done deal? Yes, it is. But if we behave ourselves, the one that is on 3A is a horror show, but it was in litigation for 10 years. Planning Board had nothing to do with that. And the same thing with Stockbridge Landing, 10 years. The same thing with Rachel's Way, 10 years. Could we do it better? Yes. But unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, it's the Sony Board of Appeals. It's not planning. <laughs> so what we're trying to do, to answer your question, is to enable through our zoning that as a matter of right on a certain parcel of land, there are a number of things that you can do as a matter of right. Thank you. Yeah, and, and that was probably a loaded question because it is. Of course, is, it was. It is, <laughs> and for me. Uh, I knew you could handle it, though. Well, thank you so much. Um, so, last question on planning for uh, Robert uh, uh, concerns um, the concept of increased density in in these villages that we have, I and mean, it's kind of the explosion of. Uh, <coughs> Units and, and, and that issue has actually been discussed already this evening. But uh, do you have any opinions about how um, do you have any opinions about whether increased densities are something that should be a priority in town near the near the in the two districts that are near the uh, the T stations? Well, so we already, <clears throat> both in North Situate and in Greenbush, we have um, we have increased density. I think uh, in North Situate, I think it's uh, 15 units per acre now, and um, we have a number of, of apartment buildings uh, or condos slash apartment buildings that are very close to the Greenbush train station. So I actually don't believe, so, the density issue is comes from the state, and it's a carrot and a stick. So, or I'm sorry, it's an incentive from the state that if we increase density, they will open up uh, the spigots for some types of funding that uh, grant money that we can we can use. So, I'm I'm very wary of that because whatever grant flows or grant money that we can get and whatever flows they come from, we need to look at whether or not we'd actually use that grant money and uh, therefore zone for higher density 
in, in those areas. And I am not a believer that higher density making apartment buildings in these two areas will actually achieve the goals of having a more diverse and you know, different income levels, economically vibrant town. I think that um, having a, to increase diversity and to accomplish the goals that Situate has said that they want to do, we need to zone for more single family houses, not large, but smaller single family houses like starter houses, and have the best possible school system that we can have. You get those two, you give people a chance at the American dream in a house where they can grow generational wealth. You don't grow generational wealth in apartment buildings and I'll leave Thank you. It. by paying somebody else's mortgage living in an apartment. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on to Mr. Moderator. Since everybody's bored with uh, lawyers, uh, I'm going to try and uh, streamline your question ask the two questions in one here, which is, uh, number one, the question was about whether the, uh, whether you considered, whether you had the power to consider the utilization of hearing impaired uh, assistive devices, assistive devices for hearing impaired individuals during town meeting. And, the, and the second question really considers the pros and cons for holding a hybrid meeting so that people don't have to attend where people who can't attend can still participate. Well, <coughs> the record pros and cons is there are no options. Very simple. There, there is no option other than an open town meeting or a representative town meeting. Now if we go to a representative town meeting, we've excluded all of the people or uh, all but say 60 people who ordinarily would come to the town meeting. Um, and you don't have the ebb and flow in terms of the interests that people have um, that drive people to come to the, uh, to the town meetings. So uh, I don't think, you know, if you're in Brookline, maybe Plymouth, um, representative town meeting may make sense uh, just because of the numbers, but I don't think it makes sense for, for Citra. Right now there is a charter commission looking at these things the other alternative is to eliminate town meeting altogether, have a town council with a, a mayor or an executive type of, uh, of government. And obviously that, you know, I wouldn't have a job. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that takes away the whole, you know, purest form of democracy that we have. So uh, unfortunately, in order to achieve purity, you've got to show up. Yeah, that, that's the way it works right now. Uh, can you can you explain? You had in your opening remarks you indicated that uh, you know you welcomed uh, participation from folks who might be interested in the advisory committee or serve, serving in that role. Can you explain what that role is? If yeah, somebody in the audience might be interested. Yeah, that's a good point, Chuck. Uh, the advisory committee um, is is the one um, committee in town that is going to advise the town meeting. They don't have any specific projects that they're doing. So it's not like the selectmen who are trying to get a water treatment plant done. It's, it's not like the planning board who is trying to put forth a zoning proposal. They are there to review these things, to ask the questions, to do the research. And it's a lot of work. Um, they start meeting, uh, you know, they have a little break in the summer, but they really start in the fall and they go right through the town meeting. And as they get close to the town meeting, maybe two or three nights a week. So it's a lot of work. They actually, you know, bring in the department heads, bring in the various departments, the school department, uh, to gather the information and vet not only the budgets, but any proposals. You know, by law, they're required to get their recommendation uh, on every issue. Um, I've tried in the uh, appointments that I've had to get a diversity of people. We've been very fortunate. We have people who have some good experience in business. We have some people who own businesses in town. That's one of the things I tried in the last round of appointments was to find someone, matter of fact, from the chamber. Uh, we thought that it was important to have, have that mix. Um, 
It's, it's an important, a very important part of our government. Uh, they don't get enough credit for the hard work that they do, but uh, um, I think so, so, three of our five selectmen got their training on what goes on in the town at the uh, advisory committee. So it's a good, um, good opportunity for someone to come along. And uh, it's interesting. Some people come in and say, you know, they have this idea or that idea, but when they sit down and really hear the whole story, they learn the, you know, the depth of what's going on here. It's a, it's a big operation. You know, it's a, it's a ninety million dollar corporation that we're running here. So uh, uh, it's a big deal to have the advisory committee. And again, anyone that's interested, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, sit on scitmod.com is my email, or you can go through the town clerk's office. Uh, if either if you're interested yourselves, or you have ideas of people who might be uh, willing to do it, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, so the advisory committee does uh, get an opportunity to weigh in on every single article that comes before a town meeting, and so that's that's another way for people to have their voices heard. Right. right. Okay. Um, so. Moving on, uh, li library. That's why everybody's uh, here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, there was not a single question. <laughs> but, uh, so I, I, thought, I thought of a question. <laughs> and really, I'm trying to figure out, what do you do? What's your function? What is your, what is the function of the library trustee? Um, what, what do you do? What, what's your primary role? There, there are several elements to what we do. Uh, I could say the most general is to support the staff to make sure that they have the resources that they need uh, so we can advocate for funding through the town and through uh, the creation several years ago of a foundation, which is a very aggressive fundraising organization. We set policies. Uh, we review those policies, policies that have to do with who can get a, a card, a library card, something as simple as that. You have to be a resident of the town, not a citizen, but a resident of the town. Uh, if you're 12, you can get a card without permission of anybody in your family. Um, we set policies on supervision of children in the building, um, so that you don't just have a daycare center with little hellions running all over the place. Uh, we have parents or caregivers uh, there for the safety of the, uh, uh, the, the child. That sort of thing. Good. Um, as far as the, uh, I recall during the COVID, uh, during the pandemic, I think we're still in it, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> if, uh, I, I, I recall when people were not going out and then they were first going out, there was some discussion on uh, social media about it, wouldn't it be great if the library were open on a Sunday afternoon because it's a place where kids can go and, uh, you know, it's a community center. And I'm just wondering if the uh, library trustees have discussed uh, different ways that the, that, the, that the library could be used as a community center as opposed to just the more traditional, let's go and grab a book uh, circumstance. Okay, that was a uh, discussion, I believe, from Situate Monthly, where somebody said, gee, the library's closed on a Friday night. It ought to be a teen center. Yeah. And uh, the challenge would be that maybe a few kids would go. There were a couple of kids who complained that they couldn't do their homework at the library on a Friday night. I was that kind of kid, of course. <laughs> uh, but we felt that the likelihood was that there would be a very, very small number of people, and the staffing that would would be required to open it for the additional four hours from 5 p.m., which is our Friday closing, to 9 p.m., which is our closing Monday through Thursday. The staffing level in that building would be just cost prohibitive for the return of a few, probably just a few kids taking advantage of it. On Sundays, we are open uh, from, I believe, October through the end of April or May uh, during the, the high school season, if you will, uh, from 1.30 to, uh, to 5. Thank you so much. Okay. So I, I think that leads us uh, with school today. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah
was going to leave. <laughs> I said, before I do my stuff. Should we move like closer to the yeah, door? Sure.
I, I, I apparently my microphone uh, doesn't exist, so um, I'm going to try and speak a little louder, and I'm going to ask the candidates to speak a little louder as well. Uh, but if anybody can hear us, and, and, and uh, um, please, please let us know, especially obviously in the back, so that we can remember to raise our voices. Um, all right, so we're left with the school committee. And the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to ask the same question of each of the three candidates. Uh, and then I'll go to a different question. Um, and I am going to change up the order each time. Uh, so with that in mind, the first question, and I'm just going to start right to my left. Um, Always it, happens. It is from a school teacher, and she asks, or why do I assume she's a she? Uh, she or he asks, what are the roles and responsibilities of the school committee in regards to curriculum, and how can the school committee influence curriculum? Do you still want me to stand up? Because that was part of yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. So I appreciate that question from If, the, if you want to use the podium for your notes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yep. Yeah. So in terms of the school committee, the roles and responsibility of the school committee are to help the leadership, the school leadership, set goals, clear, measurable goals. Additionally, we're supposed to hold them accountable to those goals. And that's why I ask if you've ever attended a school committee meeting, I ask a hell of a lot of questions. And the last thing we are supposed to do is to be good stewards of the money we have, which makes us fiscally responsible. With respect to curriculum, quite honestly, and this was something I learned as a new member, we really don't have any influence to choose curriculum. We hold our professionals and our leaders accountable. So for example, Superintendent Burkhead and his team, along with Assistant Superintendent Driscoll, made a commitment and have stated over and over again the need to improve our curriculum. As a result, if you look at our budget, we have increased the budget fourfold to put money to that curriculum. So what is my role as a school committee member? And I asked him in our last school committee meeting, if you watched, how are you going to measure the return on investment of increasing the use of our resources, limited resources, on that curriculum? How will we know that that choice was valuable and yielded benefits for our students. So those are the kinds of things that I can do. Um, the other thing I can do is I am trying to get out and listen and learn and hear from students, teachers, and families about what's going on in the classrooms because I have three kids in one school in two classrooms. I have twins and they're in the same classroom. Those are my anecdotal experiences and part of my responsibility as a school committee member is to represent the voices of the folks in this room and in our larger community. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, so while I agree with Carrie on some of the major points of curriculum, I would also add that uh, our role as a school committee member is to support teachers in their delivery of curriculum by listening to concerns, listening to families. Uh, collaboration is key. I believe that we should be working with families, working with students, working with our administrators to make sure that our curriculum is clear. Our curriculum should be transparent and accessible to all members of the community, which is something that we're putting a lot of effort into currently. We have a brand new program we're using. It's called Atlas, where uh, it's extremely comprehensive and it will have full cur curriculum mapping so that parents can see and teachers can collaborate and have vertical and horizontal alignment of our curriculum. So as a school committee member, I can support that financially by uh, making sure our budget is uh, being utilized to purchase cur curriculums that are important for students and teachers. And I can also uh, be an advocate for programming and budgetary needs that relate to curriculum tools. We're being very good stewards of our town money currently by using curriculums that are sustainable. So we're investing in online tools for teachers to uh, use with students and um, things that students can use at home as well to um, enhance and enrich the curriculum. 
we are looking to, even actually right now on our website, you can access the parent guides, which are uh, through the Department of Education, uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, which is who does set the curriculum in Massachusetts. Massachusetts is the number, the, has the top school district in the country currently, so that's something for us to be proud of. And Situate is one of the top school districts in the state as well. We, um, we're really doing uh, great work. I'm proud of our teachers. I'm proud of our students and families and the collaborative work that's um, been underway and is continuing. Um, I'd agree with what both Carrie and Nicole said. As the mechanics of curriculum, I agree. The school committee isn't intended to pick out a book or a, you know, a particular curriculum. But what the school committee does do is it creates a, a voice of the community, right? And it creates a voice of the community by what it says in its meetings. And it creates a voice of the community by what it hears from the, the parents and the teachers in this community. And so, um, while I don't, say, well, I, I shouldn't be saying, hey, let's use that book, what I can say, though, is that when parents don't feel like they're being listened to at the administrative level, and they express that, well, there's over-sexualization of books in my school, and, been, and I say this because it's happened at the coffee with the superintendent about a month ago. But a, a, a lot of parents said that. And so the question for the school committee's job then at that point is, is, are you listening to them, and what actions are you taking to address it? Right? And so because that's really our job, right? We're the board. We're there to oversee the things that the administration is supposed to do, and in those cases where they're not, Bring those questions up. You're not addressing this because I keep getting this question, right? It's not to pick a book out, but it is to express the voice of the community. 75% of the people who pay for our schools do not use them, right? So the school board is accountable to the rest of the community, not just the parents, not just the students, but the rest of the community. And so how we voice our opinion, what we say in our means, the statements that we make, statements of value, right? These things matter because teachers will take those intents into account when they pick curriculum. Thank you. I, I was going to ask, I, I, I was passed a note uh, to ask uh, that we hold off on clapping until the end. Um, so uh, please hold off on clapping, I guess, until the end. Um, Richard, I was going to ask you to just stay standing because oh, the next okay. question was coming right. to you. Um, so, uh, let's see here. Situate recently hired a director of diversity, equity, and inclusion and has made efforts to broaden other DEI initiatives across the district. What are your thoughts about these expanded efforts? Right. Um, so I have raised uh, questions about uh, how we approach diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, the question is, what's the goal, right? Is the goal diversity? Is it equity? Is it inclusion? When I was in Canada, uh, Canadians actually uh, present that, that acronym EDI, equity, diversity, inclusion, because equity in this context is the goal, right? They're supposed to have equity amongst everybody. We're supposed to make sure everybody gets the same education, right? And so that's really what we want. Um, diversity and and inclusion are the mechanisms which right, we make sure that our school is talking to everybody and accepting everybody. Um, but equity fundamentally is not excellence, right? Equity is equity. We want to make sure everyone gets an opportunity. But excellence is by definition, right, the attainment of something that only a few of us can do. And so when we think about DEI, right, it is to some extent Right, going to be in contrast to excellence. And our primary goal for our school is academic performance and excellence. And so to the extent that these things are working together, one is going to subordinate themselves to the other. Thank you. <clears throat> Nicole? All right. So when I was first elected to the school committee three years ago, there were a series of events that continued to happen. Some are at the middle school level, some are at the elementary school level, some are at the high school level. We had a frequency of events going on that were harmful, hateful, hurtful to students, racism, homophobia, 
Those things happen in our schools. They happen in every school system. We're human. Things happen. We had articles on Turtle Boy about Situate. We had instances happening on Google Classrooms during school time. We had incidences that we were on the local news. That was how frequent these things were occurring. It's unfortunate, but we're dealing with kids and things happen. It's how we handle them that matters. They're going to happen. So when we look at diversity, equity, and inclusion, if all kids do not feel included in our school system, learning isn't happening to the best capacity that we can do. If all students don't feel welcome, safe, and at home in our schools, learning cannot happen. I can tell you that as a mental health professional. If everybody's mental health isn't sound, how are we achieving any academic goals? That's not a place that I want my children to grow up in. Those are not the environments that I want my children learning in. All of our children deserve better. All of our children deserve a sound, safe, solid environment which they can thrive. We tackled these issues head on. We have a new diversity, equity, and inclusion director. And since he's hired, and this isn't to say that it couldn't happen because things do happen, but since his hiring, we even had a major you know, derailing issue. I can tell you right now there have been issues that have happened, but we have measures in place. We have staff. We're doing professional development. We're really working on these. And I'm proud of Situate, and I'm proud of parents. I'm especially proud of the, the students. The students asked for this, and we listened. And the teachers asked for this, and we listened. Thank you. That leaves Carrie. So when we think about diversity, equity, and conclusion, what I would like to invite us all to think about is this is not a binary proposition. This is not an either or. Do we pursue academic excellence or do we pursue diversity, equity, and inclusion? I would suggest that academic excellence for me is about the whole child. As Nicole said, well-being, a, a child cannot sit in a classroom. Think of yourself during the pandemic. A child cannot sit in the classroom and not be seen and not feel welcome and included and feel stress and also learn calculus. That cannot happen. It just won't, no matter how good of a teacher you are. The other, so what I want us to think about is the idea of integration. How do we integrate and create a culture where every child that walks into our school and every staff member that walks into our school sees themselves in the school community through the books, the stories, the scientists, the historical figures, everything that we introduce reflects, guess what, the world. Because when our children graduate from Situate High School, whether they're a plumber, a college student, an electrician, they are going to be in places with a diversity of folks across sexual orientation, race, gender, profession, hobbies, you name it. And we need to have our schools reflect that. And so what I'm asking is that we think about integration. The other thing I will say to you is I think we really need to be careful with language. Equity, excellence, equality, when we say equity, we are not saying that everybody gets the same education. We have IEPs, we have accommodations, we have adjustment counselors. Because students come in with all different kinds of learning, we are looking for equality of opportunity, not equal. All right, so I'm going to uh, move the next question, obviously, to Nicole. Um, so this one, I think, concerns mental health in the schools. Um, schools are inundated with mental health and anxiety issues, especially in the wake of COVID and the pervasiveness of social media. Should the school system prioritize budgetary items? Over uh, for those matters over academics or athletics in order to be prepared to address these issues, such as hiring additional counselors, implementation of educational programs designed to address social pressures and issues, and encouragement of movement and activity, even amongst middle and high schoolers. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I mean, that question for me as a school adjustment counselor, I mean, I am always 100% for more support for mental health for students. It's what I do every day. Um, I am a giver of hugs every day, which I, I cherish. Um, you know, again, it's sort of like feeling safe about who you are in the classroom. If, if a student's mental health isn't a priority, the learning doesn't take place. I mean, you know, health has to be a priority, especially mental health. I see kids, the anxiety levels that I see in children are through the roof. It's what I deal with every day. And, and it's in partnership with families. It's, you know, parents want this support and, and the kids want this support and it has to be a priority or we aren't educating the whole child. I mean, kids are coming from, you know, through the pandemic, everybody's experience was different and regardless, you know, I do see growth and I see a lot of, um, you know, resilience in kids, but I do see that they, you know, they need a lot of supports. And Situate is, uh, has very strong ratios of counselor to students right now. That's something that we've advocated for over the years and we've supported. Um, I, I don't think there can ever be enough mental health supports in our schools. Um, I am a fan of, I uh, support bringing in uh, community partners, however we can um, bring in other folks to kind of support and nurture those um, areas for students. I think outside time is obviously, actually we kind of had a joke about this beforehand, we talked about uh, PE and getting outside. It's such an important part of the day. I mean, sometimes I deliver service that way. We'll go outside on purpose just to get a break of fresh air. Um, school is rigorous, school is hard, school is um, also fun, but it's stressful and challenging. And I think that if we can have supports in place to have students achieve academic excellence, mental health has to be a priority for our community. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, Carrie next. I don't the order, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, like Nicole, really appreciate this question. I mean, based on my last answer, it won't be any surprise that I think we should also be prior prioritizing um, mental health and well-being and, and if you read the, the recent article it did talk about um, I think we can celebrate that Situate is actually doing better with respect to ratios of student to counselors. C could we be doing even better? Of course and I think that's something as a member of the school committee I'm going to be paying um, a lot of attention to. I think the other response to this question for me is going to show who I am as a member of the school committee. And what I will say to you very honestly is I think I have a lot more to learn about this topic. And I look forward to learning about that topic. And the way that I would learn about this topic is I would continue to do what I've been doing, which is meet with teachers, meet with adjustment counselors like Nicole, continue to talk to Superintendent Burkhead, because I don't want to presume, even though I'm reading the research and reading the articles, I don't want to presume to know what our teachers and staff need. I don't want to presume to know what our students need. I know what my kids need, and I'm so grateful for the collaborative team that I have at, at Hatherley with my kids' teachers, the principal, and adjustment counselors who get involved. So I'm really happy with the experience I'm having, but I have more work to do. Um, I need, I am just getting started. I have much more to learn, and I look forward to sharing what I learn with you as we move forward. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I would say that uh, this is also an area I'm probably pretty weak on. Um, I would want to see a lot of data. I'd want to read what our school is performing at. I'd like to see how our school has done. I mean, we do a lot and spend a lot on social and emotional learning. The question is, is are we, what are we getting, to Carrie's point earlier, what are we getting for that money? How is it being measured? How are we accounting for either productivity or uh, an improvement in the environment which our kids are, are living and working in. And I haven't seen that in the meetings that I've attended. I mean, I've heard them talk about what they do in social emotional learning, but I haven't heard, like, how are we accounting for it? So if I was in these meetings and asking these questions, I'd be asking for what's the accountability here? What is the smart, measurable, achievable, relevant, time-bound goal that you're trying to reach when it comes to social emotional learning. And then once we know these things, what's the goal, what are the steps, then we can decide on how we're gonna invest in mental, uh, mental health. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that brings the next, that brings it full circle, so I'm gonna to go to Carrie next. <laughs> um, so for Carrie, uh, 
Knowing that a budget allows you to operate with a finite amount of funds, do you have an opinion on any general areas of the school budget which may need attention with respect to reallocation of funds? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, so having been through my first budget cycle, I would say that one, as I mentioned earlier, I'm particularly pleased with where we're going with curriculum because what the things that I look for in a budget is the things that we're speaking about in school committees, the things that we say we value, is that happening in the budget? Do we have what I would call a value-based budget, right? And so I would say from a curriculum standpoint, we are doing that work. I think places where I would like to see um, a bit more resources if possible, and I know it's tricky with these budgets because the other thing I should say about the budget, which I, again, learned is there isn't a lot of wiggle room for the school committee once we've negotiated all of the union contracts. And so we have that further constraint in terms of our choices. But the other piece, in addition to the mental health that we talked about in the previous question that I'm really interested in and paying lots of attention to is the investment in our teachers and our staff. Because look, we have some amazing teachers in Situate, and we know from speaking to them um, that they're doing such a good job with our students, and we want to make sure that they're receiving the training and support that they need. And I mean support in, in multiple ways, from a professional learning standpoint, but also we talked about mental health, and I think we were talking a lot about the students, but I'd also like to submit that we should be talking about professional learning and professional support for their well-being. Because the thing that drives me crazy as a higher ed professor is we forget when we talk to, to teachers that teachers aren't just a means to an end to student outcomes. Teachers are human beings with interests, professional development goals, and the more we, the research shows you that the more we pay attention to that, the higher the retention is for those teachers. So, okay, that would go to Richard next. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, uh, Carrie's exactly right. Our budget is 80% personnel, 20%, uh, the remaining 20%, 10% is maintenance, and 10% uh, is kind of discretionary. Um, I, uh, one of the questions I had asked of uh, the administration last summer was, you know, how much money did we spend on professional development for STEAM, so uh, science, technology, uh, arts, math, um, and how much did we spend on social emotional learning? And uh, what I discovered was the professional development that we spent on SEL was 100% of our expenses, and we spent 0% on professional development for STEAM, for the teachers that are in STEAM. So to the extent that we have this 10% over here, which we can uh, direct, I mean, it obviously needs to be directed towards the professional development of our teachers in those areas, because these are the areas that have been most affected in the last two years, right? We took our kids out of school, we put them in an environment that wasn't conducive to learning, right? And we have to, we have to recognize that. And the people that are meant to implement that, again, 80% of our budget is personnel, they have to be brought up to, they have to be given they need to grow. Look, if you're a professional in anything, you want to be better at what you do. Whether you're playing golf, or you're a teacher, or you're an air conditioning person like myself, this is what you should be investing in. The other thing I would say, because I do come out of a, kind of a construction maintenance field, is uh, look, the health of our buildings is incredibly important. We have to have an investment in the maintenance and ventilation of our sites. And we discovered that during COVID. We can't let that down. In fact, we probably need to invest a little bit more there. Thank you. Uh, so when we're talking about reallocation of funds, um, just kind of quickly kind of Rolodexing through the budget in my head, um, I'm not so sure about I, I would reallocate anything because as has been mentioned, it's 80% staffing. Um, but I, I was going to kind of mention um, investment. I, should have mentioned this in my previous answer too, but um, investing money into teacher mental health is always, um, that kind of goes hand in hand with our students' mental health. Um, and then also for, um, in terms of mental health data, we have a PEAR system, that's the system that's currently being used by Citro Public Schools. It's phenomenal. I can say as a professional, I wish that my district used PEAR, we do not. 
Um, we use Sabres, it's a similar but different system, and we expanded that this year. So we really are tracking, collecting more mental health data um, in response to the need. Um, and so if I was gonna reallocate or, you know, I I'm always looking to kind of increase our um, kids' accessibility to specials and um, looking at, you know, art and music, fine arts, those also support mental health. It's something that the kids kind of crave. It's a place where they can be creative. It's something that takes the traditional learner and out of a row kind of boxes them in and gives them an opportunity to shine. Um, if you have a child like mine who does not enjoy um, traditional learning styles and he thrives at art, um, you know, that doesn't shine through on an MCAS assessment or anything, but he is still, you know, an A plus to me. Um, he's just not that kind of learner. So these are the opportunities I'd like to see us investing more in, focusing more on, especially as, you know, we're moving forward through the pandemic times. It's really, really important, um, again, to mental health of students, mental health of staff. Um, I'd like to see us investing more in that. Um, our professional development is, like, it's changed where really um, it is becoming more individualized for teachers and they can kind of give good feedback on how it's going and then that can guide and plan better. So, um, you know, I think we're headed in the right direction on professional development. Teachers have PDPs that they have to meet for their particular um, area of teaching and learning. So there are definitely opportunities, no matter what subject matter you teach, you're getting that experience, you're getting that um, professional development. So. All right. Uh, Richard, you're up. So uh, the question is very simply stated. Do you have an opinion about parental rights versus the school's obligation to provide a safe and accepting environment for children of all backgrounds, orientations, and identities? Uh, look, I think that's a great question. I think that um, this is uh, another one of these issues where uh, there's a lot of different opinions about it. We have a pretty wide spread on what parents think they should uh, what the school should be teaching their kids and what the parents should be teaching their kids. And fundamentally, if you can't agree on that, we have, let's just say for sake of argument, we have a 50-50 split on a particular one of these social uh, ideas, and we can't direct our teachers to or our school in a way that, that uh, uh, fixes that, that difference of opinion, then, and we, then what we've really left it with is the teacher to resolve it, right? And so all of the stress of the whole community lands on the teacher's desk, right? And I think that's probably the worst possible conclusion, right? So what we need to do as a community, what we need to do as a school board, is we need to decide what are the things that we have 100% agreement on in these issues. We have 100% agreement on the acceptance and uh, elimination of any kind of stress in the school environment as it relates to your identity. Right? We um, can agree that there are fundamental things about uh, sexual education that we want to teach our kids. Right? The things that we don't agree on in the community, whether it's situated or any community, just watch the news, see the, read the paper, right? Are to what level are we supposed to teach sexual expression, sexual <laughs> satisfaction, right? To what degree are we supposed to teach the definition you know, of gender identity? Right? These are differences of opinion that we're not going to resolve at the teacher's desk. And to the extent that we can't, we should teach the things that we all agree on first. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so I think this one's coming in the call. So on the call, you're next. Oh, okay. All right, so can you just repeat the question just so oh, we know I'm exactly sorry. what direction uh, we're headed in with this? Yep. So the question we're all, uh, I just paced out. So <laughs> do, do you have an opinion about parental rights versus the school's obligation to provide a safe and accepting environment for children of all backgrounds, orientations, and identities? Sure. So. I believe that the Massachusetts state framework sets forth a pretty clear and cut pathway to teaching students pretty much every subject they could ever want to learn in our school systems. 
This includes human sexuality. In situ a public school, so the framework says that by fifth grade, students will learn the basics of human anatomy, and they begin discussions about sexual orientation. They de begin discussions about um, human sexuality. We have that set. The framework is set. The framework is developed by educators, doctors, school nurses, panels of experts. This is what they do for a living. They're, you know, they hold these panels and they come up with the curriculum and then it is the teacher who delivers the curriculum in the classroom. In situ at public schools, those curriculums are delivered in fifth grade by our school nurses as well as our PE teachers who are health teachers now. Um, so yes, I do believe those things should be taught in school. Yes, I do believe that, and they do. Parents have every right to be involved in these conversations. Parents are encouraged by the Department of Education to be involved in these conversations. If a parent is uncomfortable with a conversation for their child at this age, they can opt out. These are not forced subject matters, but they are certainly um, inclusive and encouraged and should be discussed because bodies are changing and I will tell you that as an educator in the springtime with a bunch of fourth and fifth graders that <laughs> that is happening and these are real things and kids have questions and parents have questions and you know we are here to answer them this is a collaborative process this is not a we're you know doing things or teaching the children certain subject matters this is inclusive this is Together, this is what children need to know. It's, it's in the mass frameworks, it's set for us. It's pretty cut and dry and all the information is always available. There's another benchmark by eighth grade. They literally just build upon the same concepts. Hi. And again, in, in high school, so. Okay. So like I did to you, you just kind of took part Sorry. of the answer. That's okay, that's okay. <laughs> so I think I'll approach the question in this way. The first thing I, will, I would like to remind us is that the goal here is academic excellence. And as I've said a couple of times in my questions, I think academic excellence is about educating the whole child and this idea of inclusion. And so I think that, you know, prioritizing, we call it you know, safe, courageous, and inclusive schools is critical for each of our students to achieve their academic excellence, however they define it. Um, additionally, I, I want to be really clear and say that the role of the school committee is not to figure out what we all agree on. We know, quite frankly, that's never going to happen. And the good news is, as Nicole shared, is we have standards and curriculum that are age appropriate, that give us information on how to do that. The last thing I will say is, and, and I know Richard, you mentioned it earlier about teachers as professionals. Well, what I would also like to submit and remind us is they are professionals. And I think at some point we as a town, and I understand from listening to so many families and I empathize that previous leadership did not have transparency and did not have communication and incidents occurs. But what I'm asking our town to do is recognize that we have new leadership, we have excellent teachers in whom we should put some trust that they are professionals with technical skills. The other thing I will submit is it's really important that if you do have an issue, as Superintendent Burkhead has said over and over again, reach out to that teacher immediately. If that teacher will, does not want to talk to you, come to us as school committee members. Go to the assistant superintendent and be very specific. It's this teacher in this school, in this grade, with this thing. And I can almost assure you that they will address it. The last thing I will remind you of that Nicole said is, the great thing is we also have an opt out for parents who cannot find a way forward with that kind of uh, material. Okay. Uh... So it's five minutes to nine. I have a whole bunch of questions, but I can't get to them. Um, so I think I was going to focus, it's okay, I'll just one's for you. Uh, just focus on the two, two primary responsibilities of, uh, two of the primary responsibilities of the school committee is to manage a budget, hire a superintendent, right? Um, what qualifies each one of you to do that. <laughs> Have you had any experience in managing a budget of this size? And uh, what, you know, uh, and, and, and hiring executive personnel? 
Columbus stand up, I guess, right? Sure. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So I'll be honest, I mean, when you rephrase the question and said, have you ever managed a budget of this size, I'm going to say the honest answer is no. But I will say, as I think Nicole also mentioned, when I was at first at Hatherley, I became, you know, um, I think because all of my parent friends turned their faces when everybody said, anybody want to do the PTO president? And I became the co-PTO president. I did have to manage budgets. And as a director of a graduate program at Hopkins, and now an interim director of a doctoral program, I am managing a budget. And, and honestly, the program that I'm managing is what the dean calls the flagship program of the school. So it is a substantial budget. So I have that experience of, of managing that budget. I will also say that, again, I've said this over and over again, I come to this space, all spaces, curious. And I ask lots of questions. So I am not going to be someone who sits on my hands wondering, oh gosh, why is there a variance from year to year? I'm going to ask, and I'm going to figure out why is there a variance, what is the variance, does it make sense that there's a change, and what's the ROI from that change, better or worse? So you can be assured that I'm going to hold our leadership to that stewardship and fiscal responsibility. With respect to hiring a superintendent, I feel very fortunate that I am benefiting from the hiring of this superintendent. And I did, I did attend, um, if you remember, um, the, the search committee for the superintendent had parent interviews. And I um, attended all of the three that were the final candidates. The other thing I will say, as a faculty member, I've been on lots and lots of search committees for vice deans, for faculty. And so I feel very comfortable in the space of you know identifying, evaluating, and assessing candidates, and understand the process of searches. So, okay. uh, Nicole, uh, <coughs> yes, I do. Um, I feel extremely comfortable uh, now with budgeting. Um, of course, there's a learning curve. I'm not going to say that you know there wasn't one for me. Of course, there was. Um, Forty-four million dollars is a lot of money to manage. Um, but my experience was, uh, you know, similar to Carrie in the way that I kind of came up through the ranks. I did my time uh, on PTO and we managed a budget. We would raise tens of thousands of dollars for enrichment programs that benefited students and supported teaching and learning. Um, so yes, so I, I kind of had that microcosm of a budget and being on school council, you look at just that school's budget. So we dug into Cushing, so it would see where, what line items go where, what are we spending on this, what are we spending on that, how does, what's the bottom line, how are these items and houses purchasing benefiting students at the end of the day. Um, of course, managing school committee budget with my colleagues um, has been interesting, um, you know, to say the least. When I first came on, we had a completely different administration. I have had the unique honor, I think, of being on a hiring committee for every single administrator in this district in the last three years with one of my colleagues and I, because we always have two school committee representatives. So from superintendent, uh, assistant superintendent, I was on that uh, hiring committee as well, director of diversity, equity, and inclusion, director of business and finance, uh, our special education director, so yes, I have, an, uh, I have a very in-depth knowledge about hiring administrators. Um, I'm extremely proud of the team that we've built, um, not just myself, but uh, all the parent representatives from each school on those uh, hiring committees. We had representatives from special education, special education parents, teachers, faculty members, and you know these are things that you know, we're, you know, as Karen Canfield said earlier, you know, we're all volunteering. So. This is stuff that was outside the realm for teachers, so they volunteered outside of their teaching day to be a part of these things because they cared about who was running the show. And it, this was all in response to lack of transparency in budgeting, unclear answers, not proper management of, you know, of the day-to-day -day operations of the district. <laughs> 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 was that the, yeah, that was the, I got it. Richard, thank you. <laughs> Uh, uh, my, uh, my experience is uh, all in business. Um, I've presented, done lots of presentations to boards, understand how boards work. I've found that uh, boards are best, not just because they agree with, the pot, with what you're trying to do or sell or the service that you provide, but their job is to look over that horizon and see if the light over that horizon is the sun rising or a train about to run you over. And they're supposed to ask those hard questions. Um, I've, in my, uh, one of my previous jobs, I was a valuation um, analysis. So I did the valuation analysis and a lot of acquisitions that we did globally. 
So I'd go, uh, go around the world, I'd look at uh, the financial statements, and so I understand pretty intimately the difference between the balance sheet and the P&L, where those numbers are, why they should be the way they are. Um, a lot of engineering experience. My, my basic uh, background is in engineering and construction engineering at a commercial level. So I understand how the construction process works. We're about to spend $85 million on a new school. So valuation analysis, how to understand the financials, how the engineering and process works in construction. Uh, and then the last thing, in my last job before I moved here, I was part of what I was brought in to turn around a business in Canada. The business had a great product, but it was losing money. So how do we do that? So we had to rationalize the services, we had to rationalize the people. So not only did I have to hire new people, and I got to meet and hire a lot of new people, I also had to rationalize a lot of people, which is a fancy way of saying I had to fire a lot of people, right? And so these are hard decisions that we have to recognize. And currently, we want to spend $85 million on a new school, and we have enrollment that's gone down 500 students since 10 years ago. That's one whole elementary school, right? So we have to rationalize all of these things. And they all come down to dollars and cents. And so this is what the board is supposed to do. And this expertise is missing on our board. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm gonna ask one, one additional question, and then I'll, I'll have you guys give your closing remarks. Um, Carrie. Oh, wait, no, wait. Oh, Richard, you're up. you're up. Ah, OK. So really, the, uh, question is more globally um, to ask you to identify uh, the three specific uh, items that, uh, that, that you think need particular attention in Situate School District. Um, I did actually was almost prepared for that. I, you know, look, I would say that um, uh, the things that uh, we need to invest in and what we need to consider is um, Transparency, and not just transparency in that, like we provided more line items in the budget. Transparency in that when a parent wants to find out what's in the curriculum, it's not kind of hidden behind uh, a bunch of links to something that they have to get a way in to figure out what it is. We need to be more transparent about exactly how we're teaching our curriculum. Uh, I think we need to be more transparent about what our professional development is doing. When I ask a lot of questions about exactly what and how are we structuring the themes of diversity, equity, and inclusion, I couldn't find out what the professional development was. If you listen to the last, or maybe the two school meetings ago, we had a teacher say, yes, we had professional development. The DEI director came in and did professional development on this topic. OK, what did you tell them? What did you talk about? Why is it so hard to understand what that information is? And so. Um, and then the, the, you know, the last thing I would say is, is um, we represent the entire community. And the points of view of uh, a lot of people aren't being taken into account. And um, we live in a culture now that uh, values likes and eyeballs over discussion. Right? Facebook is not a place to do a discussion. It's a place to present your, your statement. And so um, we need to recognize that. We need to realize that disagreement is not hate. Disagreement is disagreement. We all want the best things for our kids. Thank you. OK, uh, Carrie. So I would say I'll, I'll be, I have four, so I'll try to be brief. Um, and I know Superintendent Burkhead, if he was here, he would laugh. The first one I would say is I continue, and Nicole knows what I'm going to say, I'm continuing to push the district on data. Um, how do we, de how are we asking the right research questions or good questions? Are we defining things like academic excellence? What do we mean by personalized learning? And what do those outcomes look like? What kinds of data are we collecting and from whom? So that's the first thing I'm keeping my eye on. Um, I agree with Richard on the communication and transparency. I think we have, we have started down a good road and I, I would love to share with everybody that Assistant Superintendent Driscoll is working really hard with our Curriculum Acceleration Committee to build out an entire sort of mapping of the curriculum so parents will be able to click and learn a lot about the curriculum. So I'm keeping an eye on that to see how that develops. Um, the other thing I will say is I also want to make sure that 
voices are being heard and that we are representing those voices. And so I'm keeping a close eye on how we are doing with our Boston families and the Metco program. We just hired um, a program coordinator, which I'm very excited about because I think there's a real interest in really making that program vibrant. And I think that our Boston families also need a voice at this table. And I think the way to do that is to instantiate that director and the coordinator so that coordinator can now really focus on um, connecting with those Boston families. Um, and the last thing I would say is we mentioned earlier that the district increased by fourfold the curriculum dollars. So as I said in the, the meeting a couple of Mondays ago, I'm also keeping an eye on what comes out of that great work that this, this same committee is doing with curriculum and how we're spending that money. Um, I would say that three things um, on my list would be um, increased, you know, again, I'm going to kind of double, triple down on mental health supports for students and staff and families. I think it's critical. I think um, it's just a top issue for me as a professional in the field from what I see every day with students. Um, we, we really can't provide enough supports for families and students right now. Um, I, I also think, again, supporting our arts and music, those kinds of programs. That's the stuff we need to double down on. I think we have some more work to do around fees. Um, we have our you know, eyes on eliminating more fees for families. I personally um, don't think it's right that parents and families have to go out and buy school supplies. For some reason, it just sits wrong with me. I think we should have all the materials our kids need to be successful in the buildings, and we shouldn't be running around getting crayons and things, and some of it doesn't get used, some of it does. It's a pretty decent burden for some families, and I just think that in a public school, we should be providing all of the materials needed. Um, baseline for families um, and I agree with both of them about some communication issues you know um, with all the changes that have happened I think we can do a better job of communicating you know maybe not the same messages but I think um, it's more about communicating some of the successes and changes you know and really uh, being open and honest and transparent with families about the work that's being done I think that um, you know there's work being done to be inclusive and listen to all voices and uh, you know, be, make sure that everybody's concerns are acknowledged, but I think that it needs to be communicated sometimes a little more strongly that you know, this, is, this is actually what's happening, this is what this means um, in terms of curriculum and um, district policies and, and, and such. So. Closing statements. Right. Why should we vote for you? Okay. Well, I, I actually had kind of written, rewritten, and, and thought about some uh, closing statements. And um, after tonight, I just, I think it's, I'm just going to speak from my heart on it, to be honest. Um, you know, I'm not here for the social issue of the day. I've seen even in my three years, the social issue of the day change. You know, it's fast and furious this way, and then it's pivot fast and furious that way. And, you know, that to me is not forward thinking. It's not you know, thinking about what's best for students at all. You know, I'm here for students. I'm here for students like my son Bennett, who's a scholar. He's a seventh grade math honor student. He works his tail off. He loves school. He's a, just an academic at heart. He wears a Harvard hoodie to bed because that's his dream. I am here for kids like him who are at that. That's who they are. I'm here for kids like Zachary, who is not an academic at all in the same way. He is goofy and funny and creative and he needs to see success at Situate Public Schools through his eyes. I'm here for kids like my daughter who's a first grader who spent the entire kindergarten year secluded and isolated from her friends. Her writing could be better. She's bright as can be, but she just needs the supports. And I have seen her come full circle now that we are, you know, she's closing out kindergarten, uh, first grade. And for my little guy, Leo, who, you know, he just wants to be part of the group. He is happy to be included. He is just so grateful to be in a classroom and be learning. So, you know, that's us. That's my family. That's who I'm here for. And I'm here for my, you know, my kids' friends and their friends' friends and everybody in our community because, you know, if we're supporting children and families, then we're doing right by our entire community. Carrie. Not 
good at remembering the order, so <laughs> that, the order is lost. Awesome. Awesome. I know, yeah, so the order is um, Yeah. So in case you don't remember, my name is Carrie Borkowski, and I'm running for position one on the school committee, and I would ask for your vote on May 21st. So why do I think you should vote for me? Well, I started out introducing myself, sharing that I have experience in Situate. Even though I've only been here for six years, I feel like I've done a lot in the schools. I've joined PTO, I've been the leader of the PTO for a couple of years, I've been on the school council, I've worked side by side with teachers and families, and now when there was an opportunity to be interviewed, and I tell you that was quite an experience that Richard and I went through, to be interviewed and sit on the school committee for nine months, I think I have the experience. I also believe I have some expertise. I'm an educator. What that means is I understand what teaching and learning is all about from a sort of scholarly research. I can geek out with you if you like on that. I work day by day with teachers, superintendents, and principals on their opportunities and challenges that they're seeing in their school systems. I'm also trained as a research methodologist and data analysis person, so I've had experience doing program evaluation and assessment. Lastly, I think you should vote for me because I am wholly committed to excellence, academic excellence, focusing on the whole child. And I will stand up here, as, as Nicole did and spoke from her heart, I'll speak from my heart too, which is I will tell you that I am committed and I will make sure that no kid ever feels excluded in our schools. I am a gay white woman who felt excluded for many, many years in her elementary schools and high schools. And I stand up here to you tonight and tell you that it is important for every single child to be seen and understood and their story to be integrated into our curriculum and valued. Not to be colorblind, but to value and find a place for each kid to be successful, whatever that looks like for that child. Thank you. Thank you. Um, look, we need to agree that we need to provide the best service for our kids and we need to compete for those services. We do lose kids for lots of reasons. We have had reductions in our uh, enrollment. We could have been less. It could have been less if we, had, if we had tried to reach out a little bit differently in some of the things that we communicated. Losing kids to some other program is not what we want to do. We've got to have more uh, inclusion. And that means all inclusion. It means everything. And the way you compete for those things is you don't try to exclude them, right? And so you don't dismiss somebody who believes that uh, the world is better for being a colorblind society. Um, that you don't exclude people, as our superintendent found out, because you have a population of students that hold uh, religious views, right? You don't exclude people that have uh, different gender identity, right? So all of these things, we, we have to compete for these students and we have to bring them and keep them in our system. And so think about this. We lost about 250 kids. All the schools in the area lost about you know, similar amounts. Situate lost the second most in our five neighboring districts in this first year of COVID. When all the other schools came back, Situate had still lost kids. All the other schools, except for one, had gains in their enrollment from that one year to the next. So what happens? Some, for some reason, our kids, that small amount of difference of kids left, right? Those 60 kids at $20,000 a kid because they had to go pay for some kind of private education, right? That's $40,000, $100,000. I mean, sorry, it's $800,000 to a million dollars. That money could have been stay, stay, set, kept in our community. So we have to compete for those kids. We have to keep them in our community. We have to appeal to all of them. Thank you. So uh, before you guys go, because uh, I think every candidate who showed up tonight should have an opportunity, if they, if they want, to give a closing statement. Um, uh, I, I don't, I don't know. Do I know that? a bunch of them have already left. That wasn't just it? Not to do another closing Other races. Oh, the other
Alright, that's it. Uh, the chamber, we're so happy that you guys showed up. Spent your time. Thanks.